Welcome everyone to Capitalism Done Right. I am delighted to have here on the show to, with me today, um, Stephanie Stuckey from Stuckey's CEO, um, recently reacquired the company in November of 2019. And Stephanie is such an interesting story. Um, and on Capitalism Done Right, we really like to dive deep into how the conscious business principles are having a financial impact in your business. And so I would love to start there. Can you just share with us some of what you're seeing since you've gotten the company back? Sure, well, thank you, first of all, Soryini, for having me on the show. It's my pleasure. I will give you my spin on conscious capitalism. I think I'm a bit of an unconscious conscious capitalist because, we love those. right? I, it's almost embedded in the DNA of how our company operates. So, and that's just, what we love that too. Right? So, just a quick big bit of history and a trip in the Wayback Machine to know the background of Stuckey's for folks who aren't familiar with the brand. It was founded during the Great Depression by my grandfather. And he built it from a roadside pecan stand to what was really the first roadside retail chain. Mm -hmm. We had over 350 stores nationwide at our peak in the 1970s. He had a candy plant, a trucking company, a billboard company. So before there was TA or Loves or Bucky's, mm -hmm. there was Stuckey's. Nice. And it was a great brand and synonymous with the road trip, right? And decades of people who took family vacations and they pulled over at Stuckey's and had these warm memories of being with their loved ones and having fun times, right? So my grandfather sells the company a year before I was born in 1964, out of our family hands for decades. Mm -hmm. And a series of outside corporate owners, frankly, trashed the brand. Which they would sometimes do. Right. That, and sometimes it works mm -hmm. and sometimes it doesn't. Right. In our case, it did not work. Our One of the most recent owners was a Chicago railroad conglomerate that did not understand a kitschy southern chain that sold pecan log rolls and rubber alligators. Mm -hmm. You know, it just did not work for us. So I'm minding my own business, have my own career. I'm an environmental professional, attorney, and was head of sustainability for City of Atlanta and literally get a call one day unexpectedly asking if I was interested in buying Stuckey's. So to get into the conscious capitalism piece, at that point, we did not own or operate any stores. There are only 65 locations that are licensed that we, they pay us a modest fee. No candy plant, no trucking company, no billboard company, all that's gone. There's a rented warehouse full of dusty merchandise. So that's pretty much what I bought. The most important thing was the trademark, mm -hmm. right? But when I had investors and advisors review the financials and give me their thoughts, they almost all said, don't do it, right? It was six figures in debt. The company, it was a hot mess. The name recognition was plummeting and this gets to the conscious capitalism. I saw what wasn't on the financial sheet and that was the value of the brand. The goodwill. The goodwill and the way it made people feel. And that gets to how my grandfather had a company with purpose, right? That's consciousness and how he did things very deliberately. And he had a saying, every traveler is a friend. And that meant everyone who came in contact with our brand, whether it was the employees, if it was our vendors, if it was our customers, mm -hmm. they were treated with warmth and Southern hospitality. And I think the best example of that is that during the era of racial segregation, Stuckey's was never segregated. We were always a welcoming, safe oasis on the side of the road for anyone. And so that's- That's in aged our, well. Right, and that's in our <laughs> DNA. Yeah. So when I bought this company, people came up to me and said, thank you for saving a piece of my childhood. Mm. Or African-Americans would say, thank you for being a place where we were always welcome. And so that sense of there's a greater purpose in what we're doing beyond just selling pecan log rolls. Right. That is embedded in what Stuckey's is. And so how has that helped your growth since 2019? Because yeah. we you know, we need to see the numbers in order to make the conscious right? capitalism part pay. It's not just the wonderful, you know, kind of goodwill, yes. but it's also the financials as well. How has it helped you? Several, several ways. One is the branding, which I think is what's fueled the sales is mm -hmm. I do a lot of storytelling. I do very little salesy type branding and marketing. And those stories draw on an emotional connection with our brand. Mm -hmm. And so through those stories that I share on social media, most importantly, LinkedIn, we've gotten accounts with Wawa. We've gotten mm -hmm. an HEB in San Antonio. We're in Foodline. We're in Ingalls. Wow. 
all of our major large accounts were in part owed to people connecting with the brand and connecting with the story. So that's one way, but more connected with the profit is how we treat people who deal with us in a, directly on business. So that's our employees. In conscious capitalism, yeah. we call that stakeholder, stakeholder, stakeholder engagement. Right. right. Go ahead. So our employees, we, uh, we bought a manufacturing facility. So that's how I really started to revive the brand was I bought a candy plant with my business partners. And so we're investing in a community. Right. We're not just investing in uh, Stuckies. We're investing in driving economic growth and development in the town where we are, which is Wrens, Georgia, Jefferson County, Georgia, one of the poorest counties in the state. Right. Right. We love so to hear that. We're about building that connection with the community. We want to be a vibrant, active business that is a partner with Wrens, Georgia, and not just taking from them. And then our employees, we've given three rounds of pay raises for our frontline workers. We've created teams and That's training. That's impressive since 2019, yeah. right? Right, That's well, in two years. We right? bought the company, the plant, two years ago. So and during COVID. During COVID, we just started a, a culture program right. where we're uh, doing activities and engagement and making sure the employees feel like they have a pathway to prosperity. If they get a job at Stuckey's, they may start on the front line, literally like the I Love Lucy show. They're lining up pecans that go under the chocolate waterfall <laughs> and they're on the conveyor belt. You can start there, but you can work your way up. And whenever we look at promoting, we promote from within first and foremost. And so far we've promoted from within for our shift leaders, our line leaders, our management. We just hired from within for food safety specialists. So all of that should be driven from within. So that gets to the consciousness of building a team. And it's how we, how we relate with our vendors too. So talk more about that. So when I, when I bought the company, I, we had a lot of accounts payable yeah. And I remember going through the list and I, I got a business partner because I can't do this alone. And he and I were going through the accounts payable with the team that had already been in place. And we went through and we got to one name and uh, we said, well, gosh, we owe them twelve thousand dollars. What? Wh why is that one on the books? And folks said, well, uh, they have an ask for payment. So we just we're not paying them. And my business partner said, well, that's not what we do, right? If we owe someone money, we owe someone money. And so we're going to pay them. And so we, we started this club, we call it the thousand dollar club. So we didn't have the money to pay everyone all at once, but we did have enough to pay all of the folks we owed money to a thousand dollars a month. So we called them and we said, guess what? You're in the thousand dollar club. So <laughs> we're going to pay you a thousand dollars a month till we pay you in full. And they loved it. Every, of course they're getting their money. And so we proactively reached out to this one vendor and said, hey, we owe you 12,000. And they were grateful. And fast forward a year later, we're at a trade show. We go by that booth for that vendor and they have all this lovely product and I love what they have. And we're negotiating a deal. And they said, well, we're gonna give you a great discount because you reached out to us. Mm. So it, it pays forward if you do the right thing. They also gave me a free banana hat it's a bucket hat that has bananas all over it. And so whenever I wear the banana hat, I think, pay it forward, right? Yeah. I need to give that hat to someone, pay it forward. And do you think <laughs> that that they were also connected to the brand, like this vendor that, you know, they felt invested in Stuckey's in the same way. And this is why, you know, they they were kind of along for the ride. I <laughs> hope so. That vendor happens to be of Mideastern descent and didn't grow up in this country. So that's also a challenge of reinventing a brand that's been a bit dormant is how do you introduce yourself to people who are new to this country or new generations who didn't grow up pulling over at Stuckey's in the 1970s. So uh, I don't know. I'd like to think they are now invested in a new and different way that is completely unconnected with our history. And so how do you think about as you think about growing along conscious business lines, like what's, what's, what do you, how are you going to embed this in the company as it grows so that, you know, as it expands and you go from the size that you are now to back to, you know, where your grandfather had it and even bigger that, that this stays in the DNA of the company? Sure. Well, I just think you can continue to think of new ways and internal is a big piece of that because how you run your business internally is what's reflected externally. So I think continue to invest in human 
capital to me is the most important part of conscious capitalism right. is treating the people who work for you, who are dedicating a significant part of their lives to being in your plant every day, making sure that they feel appreciated and heard and that they have a sense of belonging. So just that's constant. That's every day, that culture piece. Externally, I would really like to do more with the environmental piece. And that's my background mm -hmm. in sustainability. And we're doing some pieces already, like our pecan shells we give to a local processor who uses them to generate energy. So wow. we're reusing that. And we're the, the most important thing we're doing is with procurement, we get all of our pecans fresh grown from local farmers nice. in Georgia. So we're 100% Georgia grown certified. And back to your economic development yeah. cycle. Yes, yeah. yeah. So it's it's sourcing locally. And then also I've, I've put procurement standards in place where we're looking for minorities, we're looking for women, we're looking for veteran owned businesses, we're looking for American made. I totally accept that we're part of a global economy, but in how I'm trying to consciously grow Stuckey's, our brand is we're an American brand, so we want to support American made. We want to support local. And as much as possible, I want to elevate people who normally don't get contracts. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that means you have to be proactive. Right. And, and that's you know, elevating yeah. humanity through business. That is what hundred percent. That is what conscious capitalism is. And so you're actually doing the doing of it, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Um, Maybe I'm being more conscious than I thought I was. <laughs> exactly. So I want to come back to that. I think that's a really great point. So you, it, it sounds like these values and this way of doing business was in the company without, before it was a word, right? Before there was this buzzword, right. conscious capitalism. That's right. Right. It didn't have a label. We it didn't have did a it. label. You we just did, did it. the right thing. You did it. You did it because it was the right thing. And I mean, I, I actually think for me, that's even more inspiring. Sure. It goes to the fact that these principles, they work whether or not you have a label for them mm -hmm. and a catchphrase and you're getting written up in the New York Times or not. Yes. Right? Like if I jump off a building, gravity is going to carry me to the ground one way or the other. You know, it's like for me, mm -hmm. I think that, think that it's natural law. So I would love for you to weigh in on the, the values that you think are like the specific values. We've talked about your grandfather's, you know, everybody is a friend. You know, he never yeah. met somebody who wasn't his friend. Are there some other values that you think, you know, are really embedded in the DNA? And that is such a great question. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and, you know, specific practices that you have that other CEOs can learn from to really have those values show up in real life? So to be continued on this piece. All right, this, I, is, this is the work. Yes, we're working on that actually right now. Yeah, this is the work. Yeah, so that's, I just finished reading uh, Tony Shea's book and mm -hmm. he was the co-founder of Zappos. Mm -hmm. uh, sadly, his life was cut short, but he wrote an amazing book called Buying Happiness and he talks about culture, hiring for culture, creating a team, and he has a whole section on values. And he came up with a list of what he thought the values of Zappos was. But then he had to vet it with his team and he had to make sure it was socialized and there was buy-in and acceptance. And so the list went through all these iterations till they finally arrived at here are our core values. And he provides them in the book. And what I love when he provides them is he said, do not take my list and make it your list. Right. It's gotta be your list. And you have to do the work. Yeah. And it can't be what he, because he came up with his list, right. but that wasn't the final list. So it made me realize I have in my mind what I think our values are, but I haven't truly socialized it with the team. And that means not just my business partner and not just the management, but what do the frontline workers, the people who are roasting pecans every day in hot ovens, what do they think our values are? So we literally just started that process this week with our new culture officer who is interviewing all the employees and asking them their thoughts on the company. And we're asking them some hard questions. Like? Uh, have you experienced racism on the job? Mm -hmm. That's on the sheet. That's and a tough question. He's, he's been, and he's African-American, which I think helps. And the majority of our workforce is uh, uh, of color. Um, we've got some Middle Eastern and African-American. Interestingly enough, no Hispanics. We interviewed one Hispanic this week, so that may change. But in any event, that reflects the population of the community where we are. But I, I want to know the, the answers. And he's, he's telling all of them, everything's anonymous. Mm -hmm. It's all going to be anonymized and presented to management in a way that doesn't identify people. But mm -hmm. we can't address issues unless we know that there are problems. 
So I want them to feel comfortable. And I was really happy with the management team because I said, these are the questions we put and none of them flinched. None of them said, oh, don't ask these questions. They said, that's fine. We, we want to hear what they say. So that, that, was, that was heartening. Uh, but getting to the value, so we're going to start asking, what, what does this company represent? So what I think it represents, but I want to hear what the others think, is uh, fairness, mm -hmm. respect, honesty, and uh, respect, especially, I think of an 85-year-old startup, which is what I call ourselves. We have this history, and so respect is really important in how I'm running the company. It's respect for the past, mm. but also not living in it. So being very mindful that we've got to reinterpret and reinvent things to remain relevant in current times. So uh, maybe ask me in a year, have me back. I'll see if I've got more values. Yeah, yeah. I, and I'm working me, on it. I'm <laughs> very, very interested in this um, particular topic because what I've found um, after doing 250 of these interviews wow. is that it's hard for a company to really identify its higher purpose. That's really great. Yeah. That some companies do that. That's awesome. It's even harder for companies to really distill their cultural core values. Mm -hmm. That's a hard task. Yeah. And some companies drop off and don't do that successfully. Yeah. But the thing that I think is where the rubber is going to meet the, meet the road and to really decide the future of the conscious business movement as a whole, like in the global sense, yeah. is this idea of can companies actually correct? So if you have a yeah. value like respect, right, which you really believe in and is you're very you know passionate about it, but somewhere you know and the employee that's the furthest from you whether or not it's in terms of geography or rank or whatever word, yeah. way that you think about distance you know, the respect is not happening there this is the question about like racism or other mm -hmm. forms of disrespect if that's happening way out there and you can't either don't know if you know you're not willing to fix it you that's when people's well-meaning intentions around having a great culture go completely cattywampus. That's right. Right? Go completely cattywampus. That's a Southern term, y'all. Good word. Right? Great yeah. word. <laughs> uh, if you don't know it, then you'll learn it. But yeah, go completely cattywampus. And then all of a sudden, the intentions for being conscious or great or respectful, whatever word you want to use, like the yeah. road to hell is paved with good intentions, all of a sudden, th that doesn't bear fruit. So I think I'm really interested in this. And I think it's really great that you're undertaking the journey. And so... You know, as we think about your survey, what happens? Have you given any thought? And you know, we can talk it out. I mean, this yeah. is a live discussion. What's going to happen if you get bad news? It's about having conversations mm -hmm. and and addressing it. Right. Absolutely. So uh, I've had some issues with, I, I, you know, I think just backing up slightly. What's fascinating to me is being a CEO that I didn't fully anticipate is how much of my day is spent on HR, human resources. Well, it's humans it, it's, in the business, right? It's 30 to 40%. Right. And having those conversations with other CEOs, the ones I really admire and respect, they say the same thing. 30 to 40% of our time is spent engaging with the team, it's human resources, sometimes it's dealing with issues with employees or hiring, but it's related to that HR piece, that it's people the humans. piece. Yeah. And so when there are problems and we've had issues, I just sit down and have conversations. So uh, we'll see. But, uh, you know, I think one of the challenges will be that this is anonymous. And so unless they choose to want to be identified, we're going to have to be more holistic in addressing the issues and maybe More having systemic. a yeah maybe having an all hands meeting yeah. and saying we want to make sure we're hearing you uh, it might mean bringing in an outsider mm -hmm. right I went through leadership Atlanta and we have a day that's a race day right mm -hmm. and they bring in outside people to to have very difficult conversations about race and that's good you come out of it yeah it it was hard but you come out of it feeling like you have a, a much deeper understanding of what it must be like to be in someone else's skin, mm -hmm. right? So to be determined, we might have to bring in an outsider. We might have to have internal conversations. I first want to hear what, what their feedback is. Yeah, you got to get decide. the data first. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think it's really great. For me, I'm, you know, in these conversations, the, the knowledge is power and like the first step in any kind of 
of right. recovery process is awareness. So, 100%. yeah, the willingness to be aware, I think, and willingness to, to, to confront the truth, I think, is, is got to be the first step. Exactly. Very good. So, um, Stephanie, I would love to spend you know, the rest of the morning right? and the rest of the day talking with you about <laughs> conscious capitalism and conscious business principles. But um, thank you so much for the time and the insights. And um, everyone, we've been with Stephanie Stuckey, CEO of Stuckey's here on Capitalism Done Right. Thanks. Thank you.